It's an iPhone. <laughs> I'm good. I guess I wanted to start by saying what I just said. Your album is so freaking good. Thank um, you. Congratulations. Thanks. You've said it is your most honest work to date. Mm-hmm. How so? Um, I feel like every artist you probably speak to is like, this is my most honest album, you know? So I'm aware it's not exactly like an original quote, um, but I guess for me, like my work has always been personal, but you know, it's been personal in the sense of like, I've written songs about friends, I've written songs about, you know, falling in and out of love, but that's sort of really been it. I've never really kind of opened myself up fully in terms of, Um, yeah opening up things that kind of go on in my mind things that I'm not really even like 100% sure what's going on and I think on this song there are a few songs where I talk about my mental state my mental health um, my feelings of isolation my feelings of anxiety and for me it's kind of like my feelings of being an artist in a world where you're compared to a lot of artists which I mean I think can be related to just being a human and being compared to other humans you know fitting in sometimes feeling not worthy and there are some songs in particular a gone actually is is one which is kind of about that and I I I wasn't consciously even trying to do that I didn't like go into this process thinking like I'm gonna write songs about you know my my thoughts in my brain It, it just sort of happened so I went with it I wanted to talk a little bit about the incredible visual that co- goes along with Gone. Uh, uh, yeah, it's cool. a song with Christine and the Queens. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're yet to see the video, it's you and Chris on set with a car, there's bondage, there's rain involved. But it might not be the kind of video that many people think it is. Could you walk us through the inspiration behind the concept for the video? The concept, I would say... Um, it came from this like WhatsApp chat that me, Chris and Colin, uh, the director, were having. And um, I think for Colin and in part for Chris, um, the video is kind of about being restricted in parts by the music industry and, and, be- and breaking free of kind of those um, restraints, so to speak. And that's kind of represented by the bondage and the car and um, this idea of kind of like subverting the male gaze is something that I've heard Chris talk about in relationship to this video for me I don't see this video like that I see it um I think for me because the song is so about my anxiety in social situations sometimes and my feeling of Um, yeah feeling like I don't belong or I'm not supposed to be somewhere that I am and that feeling of wanting like the ground to like swallow you up and you feel so kind of isolated and alone and it's like an emotion that when I get when I'm like in public or out I want to like break away from much kind of like the way that we were tied to the car in that video and then we kind of like break free of it and so for me, the video is about freedom in that sense. But I suppose it's like both about, you know, um, breaking out of restraints. Um, but I think those are the two interpretations of the video. It's interesting. I've actually got a, another interpretation of the video. because me. Before I saw Chris's comments about it being a subversion of the male gaze, I was kind of looking at it through my queer gaze, mm-hmm. like... Um, which I guess in effect also denounces the male gaze. But female sexuality for me is in so much of your music. Uh, And I wanted to know how your conception of that has changed over time or if it has. I don't really think about what... (laughs) This sounds so stupid when I say it out loud, but I don't really think about anything when I'm making my music. I don't think about... Um, putting my sexuality into it I don't think about the listener I don't think about what I'm saying I don't have a plan for how it will sound and, and what the what the visual will be especially with this album maybe in the future that will change but right now no um, and I think 
I'm just very in the moment with it and I'm very spontaneous with it and that's how I like to write and how I like to create and with the video with Chris that was something that you know that video wasn't choreographed like we you know we knew we we knew there would be a car and we knew there would we'd be tied to it and we knew there'd be the rain and stuff but I mean everything else was just kind of like freestyled on the day so like the chemistry that we had and like the dancing that we did it was very much like us just feeling it and that's how I like to create whether it's music videos whether it's writing I, I don't I don't have a plan uh you teamed up with AR makeup artist Inez Arfa to design the album art for Charlie mm-hmm. it, it looks so good I really love it Thank um you. and I read that it had a goal of dismantling classic beauty ideals could you speak more on that yeah uh, it's so funny like it can't, it does but it's you know what's really funny like working with a lot of collaborators which I love um there are so many different interpretations of what I'm doing out there in the world and I'm not really sure what I said and didn't say you know it's like at that point now like I'm not sure I ever said it was about it dismantling but maybe I did like I just I'm also so fucking jet lagged um (laughs) but the thought of being nude on the album cover wasn't something that really took a long time to decide it was just like one day I was like gotta do an album cover I want it I want to be nude let's go it wasn't really at that point in time this big like deep like thought process you know or anything and then when I shot it and I saw the images I was like oh this actually really makes sense for the album because it is my most honest work it's called Charlie it's like me the human not me like the pop star but then to kind of add this like sort of confusing twist of like this hyper reality and this almost like body armor is how I see it when I look at it now you know I kind of I I I like I like that and and I suppose it is to me, I don't see it as like a, you know, sexual image at all or like an erotic image. I, I see it as a celebration of like just being open and being honest. And also I think I went with that pose because there's definitely like religious iconography connotations and I love to jokingly slash seriously call myself the savior of pop, so. So I'd play into that a little bit. <laughs> Charlie, and you're renowned for being this incredible, or as you've put it before, mass collaborator. Mm. This album, Charlie, boasts some of your biggest collaborations yet. Sky Ferreira, Pablo Vittar, Christine and the Queens, Yeji, Claro, Troy Sivan, and more. Uh, they all exist on multiple points along the spectrum we call pop. Uh, how do you balance sonic cohesion um and diversity in your bodies of work um good question um well i think in part like the cohesion is that it is just sort of like a mess you know (laughs) like like on paper it maybe some people would think it shouldn't work but i think the thing is the reason it works for me at least is when I work with these artists as a collaborator, I don't want them to change what they do to fit into my world. You know, I want them to kind of be themselves. I don't want them to feel like they have to do like the Charlie version of them, you know, that I want them to to do something that feels like really them and could be on their record and in some ways but like I'm just you know using my team my like gang to like produce it and kind of mold it but I never it's funny because I think a lot of the songs like for example the Haim song that song it kind of does sound out of their comfort zone but in many ways it is also very familiar and I just I don't know I think the reason it works is because I think I'm quite good at making people feel comfortable to experiment, but also like do them, you know? I guess, and you kind of touched on it there, but what in your experience does make for the best collaboration? No ego is key, I think. And I think 
being able to read the room is really important in any type of collaboration in life, really. Just being able to read the room and, you know, make sure people feel comfortable to express themselves, you know. For me, like a good collaborator, like a good collaborator is somebody who I feel like is irreplicable, you know, and that's how I really feel about all of the artists who are featured on the album. I, I feel like they're very unique in their own space. I don't feel like anybody could do what Sky does apart from Sky. And I feel the same way about Lizzo and I feel the same way about Tommy Cash. And I feel the same way about Yeji and Cupcake and everyone, you know, everyone on the album. I feel that way about. And I think I've always gravitated towards people who are a little bit anarchic, maybe not like aggressively so, um, but people who are defiant and, and maybe kind of um, just have always done what they wanted to do, you know. Christine in the Queens actually mentioned that one of the reasons she admires you is that you share her position of navigating the pop realm with some degree of anguish. I feel like that kind of jumps off really nicely. Like mm-hmm. you know how the pop machine works and you want to disrupt it. What aspects of pop would you like to see change she's so eloquent she's so (laughs) like whenever i hear like she said a quote about the collaboration i'm like fuck like why is she speaking so good about it like i'm always like she really she's really good um what would i change about pop um I don't know, that's a tricky question because in many ways I would change nothing. Um, because I, I like being an outsider. I'm like kind of, I'm kind of like in the gang, but I'm also not. And I enjoy that like tension that that holds. And I think Chris kind of enjoys that tension too a little bit because I think we both really love pop. But like she said, we also love subverting it. And I think for me, that's more like sonically and um, and also kind of like on social media. Like I like just, I like, I enjoy annoying people in part. I think that's kind of what it is. Like I, I enjoy like aggravating and I, you know, part of me is I'm like a wind up. Like I really like it, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know what I would change. I actually feel like pop is in a, in a pretty good place genres are are really developing and there are a lot of interesting artists who are who are getting you know mass exposure charlie you've said in the past that you're a workaholic and you get anxious when you're not working or making things which is a thing that i feel like is very relatable for our generation um Mm -hmm. but a central theme in your art is partying and exploring that. And on the face of that, I feel like it seems kind of inconsistent because you're a workaholic, oh. but you're always talking about partying. Yeah. How do you reconcile those two ideas? Is partying work for you? Well, I think partying is like the one time that I have pure escapism, you know, cause I could go away on like a holiday or like take time off at home. And I would like, fidget and I'd have so much energy and my brain would be going and I'd be like I have to do something I need to make this I've got this idea I need to call someone I need to like bombard everyone with a million emails I need to do this I need to do that like you know and I'm like spiraling out of control and by the end of like 24 hours I'm I'm like crying and I've like changed a million things about like my business you know just because I'm like sat in a hotel room having a breakdown because I'm not being active whereas if I'm partying it's like it's like there's nothing if I'm like really partying you know there's like nothing else to do except go like full throttle and I'm focused on that and that's like my one time that my brain actually is off it's like not focused on anything else it's like the one time where I'm like escape you know and I think that's why for so long it's been like a big part of life for me not only just that like I you know I take a lot of inspiration from partying I mean my my music is so influenced by like the parties that I go to like the 
the DJs are here, the, the atmosphere, you know, so it's also that, but it's the one time I'm in the moment. I have a very, I've got a lot of trouble being present. And when I party, I'm present. Yeah, it's like mindfulness for you. And <laughs> yeah. same, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a feature of workaholism is feeling or never feeling like you're doing enough. Mm -hmm. So what does success look like for Charlie XCX? It's a really hard question for me. I think from having like experienced the extremely like commercial side of pop music and, and what I do and, you know, seeing like a major label function extremely successfully with like pop music releases and doing that whole world of like promo and like that stuff maybe that doesn't just define what success is for me personally um and that for me success is making music that i'm really proud of and honestly like i got into music because i wanted to think i wanted to be cool i wanted people to think i was cool like that is literally the number one reason when i was 14 i was like fuck I'm not cool like how can I be cool like maybe I should make music then people might think <laughs> I'm cool and then I started making music and I made the worst music when I was 14 it was like the most uncool shit you have ever heard and it's still on the internet if you want to check it out it's so bad it didn't the plan backfired um but look at you now but look at me now there's <laughs> some people out there who think I'm cool definitely some. I have them fooled <laughs> and the joke's on them, but like, there's people out there who think I'm cool. So maybe like success is, fe guys, success is feeling cool. <laughs> okay, like fuck what everybody else taught you. Just feel cool, life's better. <laughs> no, that's not, you know, whatever, but like kind of. Kind of. You know, not no, not a no. <laughs> I just wanted to talk a little bit about track 10. Uh, as a song of Pop 2 that was so well loved and hugely critically acclaimed and whether you felt any kind of like trepidation or apprehension about releasing it as blame it on your love. Yeah, four years. Four years of um, apprehension to be precise. Um, yes, <laughs> like that conversation has been just yeah, a constant one for a really, really long time. You don't know how many different fucking versions there are of Blame It On Your Love. Like, there are so many <laughs> versions. How many times have you heard that song in a different version? I mean, there's about a dozen versions. There is, yeah, it's, it's oh nuts. My God. It's totally nuts. And um, yeah, so I was apprehensive because I know people love track 10 and you know, obviously track 10 was released first, but actually blame it on your love came years before track 10 happened and originally blame it on your love was going to be on pop 2 and then i was just like it doesn't work it doesn't work it doesn't fit and ag agreed so he was like let me just you know sit with it and then i was like what did you do i'm obsessed <laughs> like you're a maniac and then i like re-recorded vocals and that's how track 10 was born um but yeah i I knew, because Lizzo wasn't on it until like very soon before it dropped. And I knew, I just knew I wanted her to be a part of this song because um, I just felt like it would make it better. I think it did make it better. And I think it made it cooler. And I think she brings an energy to it that makes sense for the original version of the song. Um, but I knew it was a fan favorite. So yeah. And also it's like, it's kind of a weird like it's weird you know it's like yeah. not many people release the same song twice like not in a remix form do you know what i mean totally i mean it's the opposite of a remix yeah yeah so it i think people really loved the like track 10 reference i think that that's why people kind of felt it are you ever going to release those other dozen versions do you reckon they'll ever see oh, the light of no. day no i mean god it's like the most minor shit yeah you know? it's Oh God! It's <laughs> honestly the one. Actually, the one thing is, is 
I can't even go into it. It's like this whole, this nightmare, like trumpet sound oh that's like God. haunted me for four years. <laughs> like, and trying to, you don't know how many producers I've called have been like, look, just try and make this trumpet sound cool. Like, <laughs> so many people have tried, like, Umru, AG, maybe, I don't think Sophie tried, um, like Dylan Brady, Stargate, Seba. Like more, so many people tried. It was just whatever. A dream team of producers. It's done. Trainer. It's done now. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's now. perfect. We we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie XCX, thank you so much for dropping by Monday Arvos and FBI Radio. Uh, you've got one more song to play for us. Uh, mm. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Okay. So I want to be a bit narcissistic and play a song from pop two i want to play i got it because it has pablo it has cupcake it has brooke and it has me um and i think it's the most hype song on pop two and on um the new album (laughs) there is this song called shake it with um, Brooke, Pablo, Cupcake and Big Frida and I think it's even more hype. It goes so hard. It's incredible. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I am really interested to see the reaction to that song because um, I think for some people it's like too hard you know, but I mean I love it and I love everybody's verse on that song. So yeah, I it's kind of like, it's almost like an RIP to I Got It because it's like, it's so <laughs> much harder than I Got It. Like you thought I Got It was hard, you don't know anything. Like Shake It is like, yeah, I don't even know. It's so wild. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I'll play I Got It um, just to, you know, commemorate it before it dies and Shake It is born. <laughs> I got it, 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 I got it. I got it, 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 I got it.